Melinda, welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. I love this podcast. I'm really stoked to be here. Thank you so much. And feel free to say that as many times as you <laughs> like throughout our interview today. I will. I sure will. That. Melinda, where are you joining us from? I'm at home. I'm just sitting in my neat from behind me, messy all the rest, all the rest around me house in Shelbyville, Kentucky. On That's how Sunday. we do it, right? How we do it today. Yeah. Yeah. In Shelbyville, as we had mentioned before, I have people around there in Shelbyville, in Louisville. It's places close to my heart. So I'm so glad you're here today. Yes. Thank you. So, Melinda, what is going on in your life? What's big for you right now? Um, well, I'm getting ready to co teach a writing workshop, uh, which I'm really excited. I connected with another local writer we both published around the same time and just had this instant connection and thought we would um, work on and roll out a writing workshop to encourage people um, in their writing journey but then just answer questions about that whole process and just encourage women that they have a story and that we want to hear it and um, doing that and um, I'm in a band so we've been writing some new songs and that's been really a fun new thing for us and then you know I'm racing too a preteen and a teenage girl uh, with a really busy husband. So I feel like every day is something new, but, you know, it's good times. I am two days into the teenager journey. And this wow. morning I got the uh, window wave <laughs> when oh, my yeah. son leaves for school. Yes. You know, I tap on the window and wave. And if he's moody or mad, he won't look back and wave. But I got the window wave this morning, so oh. I'm counting that as a success. So when, yes, it's up and down of, for sure. Yeah. What's the name of your band? The Pretty Goods. The Pretty Goods. I yeah. love that name. I feel like, you know, we're just great. Well, they're pretty good. Pretty good. I mean, I feel like if we manage the expectation, then, you know, you hope that they think you're better than that. But you don't want to be like the phenomenals and then then be like, I mean, you're pretty good. So. Yeah, you should have a bunch of people coming up and saying, pretty good. You guys should name yourselves. Terrific. Fantastic. That's what happens. We, we're glad about that. Yes. That's awesome. So I hope everybody goes and Googles the pretty goods after this yes. podcast. Thanks. We love it. And you are doing a writing workshop, you said. Have you done some writing? What's out there that we can soak up? Um, I've written a book. I um, actually have it right here. I've written a book called Uneclipsed. So um, about shadows emerging and finding the light. I write in our local magazine here and just some freelance stuff here and there also. And just for fun all the time. So complete self-serving question. Do you yes. also do, a work, do work as a muse? And if so, how do we get those services? A muse? No, I do not. Oh, oh I had to try. <laughs> so Melinda, you have an incredible backstory. So, and I think it's going to resonate with a lot of folks. I would love to jump into that. Are you ready okay. to jump into that? Let's do it. I'm caffeinated. Where, I'm ready to go. Awesome. Where do you want to start? Well, when you and I first spoke, I think what resonated with me so much about your podcast is I, and as I mentioned before, we were live. I wish that I had had you to sort of walk alongside with and lead me in so many uh, moments of the unraveling of my tradition, uh, traditional religion. Um, so that's it. We could jump in right there. Like we could talk about all the things you're not supposed to talk about at the dinner parties or at your family gatherings, you know, religion, um, my addiction to alcohol, you know, all those fun, fun things. Well, we do call this pursuing uncomfortable. So let's I mean, I've been comfortable in several areas. So just pick one. All right, let's start with the addiction. Okay, sounds good. So um, people don't just wake up with an addiction. There was a journey that took you there. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? I do because I think it's really important to be on the lookout 
for yourself. Uh, not for you in particular, but like for me, I think I was all of us. Mar- yeah, I was marching towards. It's a really fine line between end of day ritual to dependence. Mm-hmm. And I think my toe was across it before I took some inventory and said, maybe this is like a thing. But, you know, no one ever, no one ever pursues addiction. It's the slow, um, sneaky creep in. And um, so then, you know, I never even drank really in, like when I was younger, high school, college, I got a job in corporate America when I was 27 and a Chardonnay goes with the job. I mean, you just, you're at dinner, you're, you know, you're whining and dining clients. Um, and I really loved it um, from, from the word get. Um, when I wasn't whining and dining clients, I was just whining and dining at home. And I looked in the recycling bin um, at the end of one week and there were seven wine bottles. And I was the only one that was drinking wine. And I thought, well, that's, that's, that's a lot. Maybe I should, you know, step back. So I would you know, for a few days, um, and then, then wouldn't, um, I found that I was a little bit, um, sharp when I drank red wine. My husband would say I was a lot sharp when I drank red wine. So I was like, I'll just switch. So I found vodka and that was, I graduated to vodka in uh, hopes to actually, um, curb some of my, uh, you know, when I had red wine. So, um, I was drinking every day, um, and then I was having fewer glasses, but that's only because strategically I went to TJ Maxx and bought the biggest glasses. And so I was like, oh, I'm just having two. They're like, got, they're like this, you know, gigantic. So, um, and then I just started sort of walking. We call it sort of like walking off the cliff. I just wasn't, um, I was picking fights with my husband. I was, um, you know, making those phone calls the next day. I'm so sorry for, I don't even, I'm not exactly sure how that went down or what I said, but things were becoming a little blurry. I was still really, I think, um, one of the things is that I was really not unmanageable, like, um, from outward appearance. So, you know, one of the come to terms or like your come to Jesus is that my life has become unmanageable, but across a lot, a lot across the board, my life was still pretty manageable. And so really as an addict, you only have to convince yourself that you're okay. And then your truth, then it sounds like truth to everybody else. Mm -hmm. Um, So this bottom like for you. Yeah. So that's the thing. I didn't really have like, you know, falling down a set of stairs in front of a room full of people and the gasp or like a, a drunk driving accident or anything. I just, there was a moment when my dad gifted me a picture frame with my kids' pictures in it. And it said, when I grow up, I want to be just like my mommy. Mm-hmm. And I thought, I went in the other room and like almost had a panic attack. I thought, oh, no, I, I wanted more for them. Um, that was in December. So I spent the next, um, till August of the next year, really strategizing sobriety. like. Yeah. I was afraid that if I gave up alcohol, then I would just trade it in for something else. And so, um, you know, running or Amazon Prime or not necessarily another substance, but just something. And I was already so good at what I was doing. I thought I would just sort of see it through the to the end. Um, And then I think it was just a a sort of march toward the state that I had circled in my calendar, which was going to be the Wednesday after my kids started school that following Year. So it was really in the summer that I decided, okay, I'm, I'm going to get sober. And by that time, there were some gaps, more gaps in my actual life that I couldn't recall or um, I would reach really intentionally for and they weren't there. And um, so that was seeping out and my kids were starting to go, why don't you remember that? And so that just scared me enough. Like I, the trajectory of where I was headed there was plenty of examples of what that was going to look like for me, or mm-hmm. I was going to make a better way for myself. And that seemed less terrifying than, you know, ha- just throwing my life away. Well, good for you for having that foresight and the courage to head it off. Thank you. And faith has always been a big part of your life. Always. Yes. Some ways we're helpful and some ways we're not. 
Right. And I think they were all intended to be helpful. So, yeah. Yeah, can you give us a little insight on how faith interacted and either supported or uprooted your journey? Yeah, I think when I was little, I um, I didn't really, I never wondered if there was a God or um, I just sort of knew that there was something bigger than me outside of me and that at the same time was a part of me. But I'm, um, I've, I've been, I've been very much of a, was very much of a pleaser and recovering in that too. But I was very much of a pleaser. And I remember like sort of having this shift at some point, you know, in Sunday school when they're passing out the goldfish for all of the, you know, missionary journeys of Paul's that you can name. And you're like, okay, or you're naming books of the Bible and you realize this is a graded system. Like, oh, okay. So this is a, this is a, and there's a carrot, it's dangled, I'm, I'm to get it. And I'm, there's, it's formulaic. And I think before when in my little girlness, I just was like, you know, kind of ended and began there. But then I realized very quickly there was a, it was a template and a formula that I was supposed to follow. And so I did it and I did it well. I mean, I, I got a lot of goldfish and gold stars in class. Um, but I, um, I went to uh, uh, Disciples of Christ Church when I was young and loved it so much. And then there was a shift where when I was in high school, um, my parents, we started going to um, a more fundamentalist, like a like a full gospel um, church. And I really loved so many things about that. So I want to walk into this conversation carefully. I feel like there was such... You know, and I think we can say that nothing is only and always one thing. I can say that now, but I couldn't say that then. You know, like a both and, like dualistic thinking, it was like a stranglehold. Um, Oh, and, you know, many things can be true about one place. That's right. Your experience in that place a lot of people will experience blessing there and there are a lot of yes. good things there, but there were other things there as well. Yeah. It's and I experienced the, blessing there. Yeah. It's not that one place is all good and another place is all bad. Right. There are many, many different forces always alive and uh, to be experienced in any place. Yes. Yes. When we went there, I was really enamored with the worship, you know, it was, I loved the whole production of the worship. Um, I, I remember thinking that I showed up with some things missing, like, oh, I need to get some things. I need a true love weights ring. I need a prayer language. I might need to pick up a tambourine and there's banners. Where do I get a banner? Um, I, there, like I came ill-equipped. Um, (laughs) But, you know, uh, and I felt like I, I, I think that it was sort of marketed again with the best intentions of like, you are missing some things like this is the full story. And so where you came from was like, that was sweet, but it's not the full story. And so you have to have all these sort of tools in your toolbox to, you know, be really be saved, maybe um, really definitely really be righteous following God and. Um, and so I felt like, oh, well, that's just a further continuation of the setup of all the hurdles that you have to, you know, jump over in order to get to God. So that really solidified to me that God is sort of like a commodity. You got to go get God like you go, you know, like I say, like you go get God like you have to go get a loaf of bread. And like it's it became very everything became very externally motivated and inside. I was a mess. And I miss the, I miss the wonder. Um, you told me once that you traded in the mystery of God for the commodity of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I um, really I sought after certainty with fear being the impetus for my, you know, going from glory to glory to glory. It was just like, oh, I got to get this. Now I got to get this. And what if, you know, if I, and if I don't get this and. I'm really missing out. And 
Um, so yes, that will, that will squeeze out any room for mystery when you are on a track for certainty and you're chasing after God, like God is a commodity. Yes. You know, I don't want to gloss over that. You're on a quest for certain. We would all love certainty. We all would love to have that burning bush experience. Right. But the thing about the burning bush experience is, you know, Moses was standing before it. Moses was experiencing that burning bush experience and he too had doubt mm -hmm. in front of it. Certainty, I think, is a construct that we set out for ourselves and it doesn't necessarily exist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of my favorite stories, if I can have a moment of Please. indulgence here, is Gideon. In the book of Judges, Gideon is the uh, the soul that was tapped to lead the Israelites when the Midianites were attacking and when they were the huge threat. And what I love about Gideon is his uncertainty and his quest for certainty. Yeah. God and Gideon had a great relationship and Gideon said, okay, God, I'll go and do what you want to do, but I really want to have certainty. I want to be sure about this. So okay. let's do this. I'm going to set some fleece out tonight in front of my door. And you know, the cool morning when I wake up, if there is no dew on that fleece, then I'll know that that's your sign to me mm -hmm. that it's going to be a success. And God said, all right, let's do it. So they did that. Gideon wakes up the next morning and there's no dew on the fleece. And what does Gideon do? He says, okay, awesome. Let's try it again. And if it happens again, then I'll know. Mm -hmm. God says, okay, let's do it. So then the next morning it happens again. Gideon goes out there and there's no dew on the fleece. And what's Gideon's response? Why? Okay, well, just time. one more time. Just one more time. Let's do it again. It's a couple of three times. Yeah. That God comes through for Gideon and the way Gideon asks God to speak and Gideon still doesn't have that certainty. <laughs> and right. then the other story, when Gideon goes to God and says, okay, we are really outnumbered. We need to fix this. And God said, okay, here's what you do. I need you to go do X, Y, Z. So Gideon goes and does X, Y, Z and <laughs> loses about half of the people he had <laughs> and comes back to God and says, okay, so, um, Thank you. However, I was looking for a bit of a different result. I was looking for an increase in numbers instead of a decrease in numbers since we are, you know, like 10 to 1 outnumbered here. And God said, okay, awesome. Let's do this. Go do X, Y, and Z. And Gideon does and loses even more people. Yeah. And God said, okay, we're getting closer. Do it again. And Gideon does it again. And finally, Gideon has just a handful of people. And Mm -hmm. you know, perspective. And God says, okay, now it's perfect. And Gideon has said, I think one of us misunderstands perfect. <laughs> These numbers aren't matching up for me. And, but the thing was, God had the victory and it came through, but God had to get rid of all of the extra stuff mm -hmm. so that God could be present. And man, I love hate that book and that story yeah. because I am such a Gideon. I want that certainty. I want the numbers to add up. I like the balance sheet to be in my favor and it doesn't work that way. And someday I hope to learn that lesson. But in the meantime, God is saying, okay, awesome. Let's do this. Go do these things. And I've got you. Yeah. And I keep thinking, okay, am I communicating in opposites? Or have I misunderstood the meaning of these vocabulary words? Because <laughs> what I have in mind is not what's happening here. Yeah. No, I feel that. Wow. Yes. Yes. And I think that's how we live. You know, in my mind, everything is how would Monty Python portray this on the big screen or on the stage? <laughs> that's great. But it helps me to have some levity, especially for myself, because I too want certainty and that just isn't a thing that we get. Well, I think too, you know, for me, when I'm, when we transitioned to that particular space, I remember like hearing at that point, like that the Bible was literal. And so 
to open it up with a literal interpretation or try to understand it literally, man, that jacked me up. Because I was like, well, here it says this, and then this is this, and I didn't I have, I wasn't steeping in the historical context, like, give me some kind of uh, framework around this. I was just, you know, at that point, sort of plucking here and there. And, you know, at that point, you're like, where do I go to college? Let me look and see what the Bible says about that, UK or transy, you know, and you just, you get so distraught if it doesn't just literally say exactly what you want, because that, um, that, and that chalks up all of the broadness and the expanse of the spirit of God and makes it like, like everything felt like an algorithm. And I thought I was failing the class and I just wanted to get everything right. So I don't, and, and, but at the same time, there was this rumbling inside of like, okay, so this religion thing has certainty. That's a thing that has, I mean, that's, that's an algorithm. I know what I'm supposed to do next. And all the supposed tos were very clearly outlined. Um, and then the prophetic stuff was the messy part of that component, which was a whole nother new thing. But even in that, I felt like there was a way that I was supposed to be doing that. And if I wasn't doing it right or long enough, that wasn't enough. And so then it felt like my little girl wonder and then this other thing were in opposition. And so then at some point I just flung it all off and just sobbed in my closet and just said, I don't even know what to think or what I'm supposed to believe or any of it. But like, can you just hold me? Can you just be here like with me? Like, I don't need a lightning burst or even a burning bush. I just need like the breath of heaven to just brush up against my skin and let me know like I'm not alone. What a beautiful statement. Just need the breath of heaven to brush up against me. Oh, I'm going to steal that, by the way. Go for it. Go for <laughs> it. You have very well, um, you have very skillfully described the stages of faith. Um, many folks who have studied psychology will be familiar with John Piaget's stages mm -hmm. of cognitive development and how our brains grow and develop and grow in their capabilities, how as little ones, we only have concrete awareness. We're not capable of abstract thought. And as we become a teenager, we become capable of that and those different levels that grow throughout our lives. James Fowler did some parallel work. He built upon Piaget's theories that are doctrinal now. They're just mm -hmm. foundational to how we understand human development. And Fowler developed stages of faith development. And they go along in a parallel sort of way and build upon John Piaget's work. So mm -hmm. just as when we're little, we only have concrete thought, we're only capable of concrete faith. Mm -hmm. But before that, when we're real little, everything is a mystery. Yeah. Everything is just wonder. You know, go on a walk around the block with a three-year-old mm -hmm. and you will be open to the wonder of life around you. And I really believe that's what Jesus was talking about when he called the children to him and said, you know, the kingdom of heaven is open to those like this, that have that sense of wonder and aliveness. Yes. But as we grow, we lose that and we become locked into this abstract or not the abstract, but the, the literal concreteness of mm -hmm. our faith and understanding. And it's not until we're, you know, in our 20s, that's a really difficult time in faith development. When we're in our 20s, that's when things begin to unravel for us. Mm -hmm. One of two things will happen. Either all of those concrete things that we built upon will become solidified because we mm -hmm. will not allow anything to, to shake that. Or everything shakes that and yeah. we are off chasing the demons and finding where the demons dwell. Yeah. And when we do that, we'll ultimately in our mid thirties, we'll find our way back and we're then capable of another stage of faith that weaves together all of those things mm -hmm. in a beautiful new way. Yes. And that's what you've described. You described that moment sitting in your closet, wanting the breath of heaven to just brush up against your skin as that illustrative of in your 20s when things were coming apart and you just wanted 
a foothold somewhere okay. to get you through this wandering so that you could find your way back. Yeah. And yes. I love that beautiful scripture. And so many folks get lost in the wandering or shame themselves because they're wandering. But what people, what I would love people to know is that is an an outgrowth of your faith. That is a next step. That's a growing yes. in your faith journey. And it's going to bring you to a place of wonder. And It does. And it is scary. I remember going from the closet, you know, eventually I ended up back um, at another church, just a uh, conservative in a different way, um, like a Southern Baptist situation. And um, I remember feeling like, okay, I, I can do this thing. Like it's time. I'm a mom. I need to be doing the thing. Right. And it was, again, like the sweetest people you've ever met. Precious. I mean, amazing. And, you know, just cool people. And then it, but every Sunday I found myself like wiggling in the pews when certain things were said. And I liken it to putting on a wool turtleneck in the dead of July. Like I was moving <laughs> and not breathe. Like I'm hiving and I'm sweating and like, there's nothing wrong with this, but it's like, this turtleneck is just too small, but you're so, I'm so careful of how I say that because that makes it sound like, oh, the hell grown. And it's not that at all. It was just in the wrong spot. And so it took this wonder that I had uh, re-engaged with and made me feel shame over it. Like I should not be this messy or it should not be this big. Like certainly there's some formula that this will work. And it just didn't. And then someone said, hey, have you ever read Richard Rohr? And well, that just changed my life. You know what I mean? I was like, oh, okay. Same. I mean, right. And so it was just, just someone else off the island saying, well, this really helped me when I was, couldn't find my footing and didn't have, you know, any scaffolding. Um, and so it was be that being introduced to Richard Rohr and then starting to read the mystics was really like so life giving to me. But you take that and then you try to sit on Sunday mornings and like the churches where you where your friends go or where your parents go or and they're all amazing and this is not anything bad about where they go or where they are. I just went and I always felt so weird. Like just so like okay, okay, and then what? What else can we talk about? Like can we talk about like the like that liminal space between like this and that and what about both and can we talk both and no what do you mean there's no program for that okay you know and so just leave like <laughs> it just yeah. didn't feel like there was a spot and I felt like I was showing up with ideas or questions that felt like I was throwing a hand grenade so I just and I didn't want to I didn't do that I mean I didn't go and disrupt I just but I felt like disrupted inside and some folks might be curious about mystics Mystics have been around since the very beginning of Christian faith. Uh, they have always been a part of ancient faith traditions. The Desert Fathers are mystics. Uh, John the Baptist was part of the uh, mystic community in his time. And they have always been a part of the Christian tradition from all the way back. They, uh, a hallmark of the mystics is the being at one with God and experiencing that unity in oneself. So mystics will often have quote unquote religious experiences anywhere in any circumstance. It might just be an alleyway, but something beautiful there will capture their soul or in the woods or anywhere in creation. But for a mystic soul, it's all about that connection with God in that moment. In first or second Kings, when Elijah is fleeing from King Ahab and Queen Jezebel and is finally able to just be still and be silent, and that still small voice of God came to him, that's a mystic experience. Mm -hmm. The Bible's full of those. Yes. So. And, and, and I think, um, you know, I thought, should there be fireworks that accompany this? And I was so used to big, um, high octane spiritual experiences that when it came just to 
a more contemplative practice because I really needed to drown out all of the well-marketed positions and just go, what if I just got, what if I, let me just go back into that closet and just sit with God, um, then what? And it was, it's a big shift from needing so, such a, like kind of an emotional machine or like a really well um, planned out um, worship experience. Um, and I, I, I was leading worship, so I was trying to create that experience. I'm not, and I, that's not even a bad thing. But I just thought, what if I pull myself out from all of it? Like, then what? So there's been a couple of times in my spiritual journey where I've been very entrenched in the program and then said, I, my, like, I, my brain and my heart and my spirit just need a respite from that so that I can reconnect. And, um, and thankfully, you know, because there was a short season. I, do, I don't know if that it was that short, but there was a season where then I had to go, okay, I'm definitely cynical. So how do I come to the other side of that? Because that I wasn't, you can't, you can't really encounter. I mean, you can, and you can be a total mess and encounter God. So I'm not thinking you have to be shined up. But if you just like, if I'm just steeping in cynicism over the way something is done, then, I mean, that's not, it's not healthy for anybody or anything. And it it's like a blocking a channel just to, you know, for you to feel the divine. It's for you to feel God. It's not that God's like, because you're cynical, I will not connect with you. You're just like all junky and sludgy inside. So, you know, it's like plumbing. <laughs> Depends. You know, you're, when you have water running in your home, you have those pipes open and you open up the tap and the water comes out freely. Yeah. yeah. If you got a lot of junk in the pipes, the water is going to trickle out or not at all. And that's just, in a sense, what you're speaking of. That we can put a lot of layers on that keep the love of God, that presence of God from coming to us fully. It yeah. just clogs the pipes, the spiritual pipes. Yeah. And yes. sometimes you just need to to clear it all out. And for you with the mystic soul, that is the contemplative practices and the being still. For others who have more of a head faith, those well-crafted services might be the balm yes. for that individual. Uh, for those who have a heart faith, they just may need to hear the stories that others have shared of mm -hmm. their faith experience and their, their, um, their encounters with God. And for still others, the, uh, what I call advocates, they need to hear the stories of how systems and structures have been changed to open up the, kingdom of heaven if i will that's kind of an archaic term that experience of heaven on earth to others so yeah who however you find yourself in those places yeah there's a real viable connection available to you but you got to do a little internal work of clearing out those pipes you do and i'm really grateful i have a few friendships where um the we land really differently on things and so sometimes I'll like I have all like podcast swap with somebody or book swap with somebody that I know is gonna encounter it completely different and say hey can I just want to know your position on this like I'm not even gonna talk which is like a big deal for me but I'm just gonna listen I just want to hear like your actual because I can go sit in the echo chamber that tells me I'm right all day long but I, I'm not I don't want to know that I want to encounter something that's totally different and then just respectfully say that's where you are and that's where I am. And I make myself engage in those practices so that I don't get self-righteous in the other way or go try to evangelize in the other way and just let be. And my husband's very good at reminding me when I'm like, oh, I don't know. And he's like, it's just where they are. Remember when we were there and, or, you know, it's not, and it's not a matter of being further down the road. It's just at a different spot in the big wide open field. So it's not like a linear journey where I would ever think I've gone farther at all. Uh, but it's just good to look across the field and say, oh, there are all those other people searching and seeking and how that's where they are. And the stages of faith development can really help with that because there's not a checkered flag at the finish line. Yeah. In fact, yeah. it's really rare that any of us get to stay the, the final stage. Uh, you know, think Jesus representing that final stage mm -hmm. or 
a Dalai Lama or someone, we're not going to get there because we don't do the inner work to get there. But we have an experience of God where we are. Sometimes Mm -hmm. life determines what's available to us because if you encounter traumas, you have to do a lot of work to heal from trauma and that's Mm -hmm. reflected in your faith life as well. So wherever you are in your faith journey, in whatever stage of faith development, God is present to you in that state. Mm -hmm. That's right. And as God is present to others in the other stages. I think recognizing that and like you said, embracing that we are all at our stage and interacting with God, higher power, spirit, however you want to name that right. in our own way. That could change the world. That could change our communities. Yes, I agree. I agree. So, Melinda, I could continue to talk to you all morning, oh, no. all afternoon, <laughs> all week. Um, Others might get a little tired of hearing us talk back and forth. (laughs) So sorry about that. But um, I do want to give you the final say. Uh, What would you like to leave folks with today if there's a message that you could share? Oh, gosh. Um, I spent a lot of my life, um, a great deal of it, just trying to sit in the boxes and meet expectations that I thought were set before me. And I always say my first addiction was approval. Um, and I thought that there was just a, a certain way and a certain track. And so I'd say if you're, if you're in a place and something just is stirring inside of you, um, like not, don't, to not be afraid of curiosity, to come into the curiosity of your faith, of, you know, presets that you feel like you have to do because of where you live or who you love or, you know, how you, how you go to your job or whatever, just, um, keep going. I mean, it's, like this as trite as that sounds, but really just keep peeling back the layers um, because there's such beauty in that discovery and exploration. And even though it can be scary, like you're not unmet, you will be met. Yeah. And don't be afraid to set out the police from time to time. That's right. Set out the police for sure. <laughs> Melinda, thank you so much. And links to your band and to your book and to any, uh, anything else, uh, check the show notes, folks. Click on those links. Check out Melinda and all that she's up to. It's really great, and it's inspiring. It's going to make you smile for sure. So thanks again, Melinda, for joining us on the podcast today, and I hope to talk to you again. Me too. Thanks for having me. I love, love, love your show. This has been so fun to be a part of. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.